Okay, ready to go? Good to have everybody back and we're in for program number four this afternoon, number 55. Iris wants me to remind you of that constantly. This will be the last program in book number 55 and hopefully we'll finish 2 Peter in this one and be ready for 1 John in number 56. Okay, good to see everybody and uh, for those of you joining us on television, again, we always like to make you feel welcome and we like the letters that say we feel like we're sitting back there on the back row. Well, that's just exactly what we wanted this to be, a, a classroom effect and uh, We've had more than one letter that said, I almost feel like I'm back in college again, sitting in a classroom. And uh, that's all we want to do, is just simply teach the book and uh, hopefully make it understandable so that folks can uh, study it on their own. Okay, let's pick up where we left off in uh, 2 Peter, chapter 3. And uh, we're down there at uh, verse 14. Wherefore? Because of all that we know now from the Word of God is going to happen, and nothing is going to stop it. We don't claim to know when, but it is coming. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, in other words, the end of time and the whole operation of this planet and the human race, the human experience, it's going to come to an end. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent. In other words, don't take these things haphazardly. Be serious about it. God is real. God is genuine. He's sovereign. He's in control. And His Word is true. You know, I think that's what people are finding out. The more you study this book, the more you realize that it is the Word of God. The meticulous way it's been put together. It's just impossible for mortal men to have done the things that are evident when you study the Scripture. See, that's why we know from, from other people's research, people who scoff the Scripture are usually people who have never studied it. They have never come to realize the little intricacies that are so evident for those of us who do study. And so this is what Peter is telling his folks. Be diligent. Because after all, like he said back, where was it, in, uh, in chapter 1 in this same book, that we're not following cunningly devised fables? Yeah, turn back with me a minute, because that says it so well. Still in Second Peter, but back to chapter 1. Verse 16. Remind yourself of this constantly. Second Peter, chapter 1. Verse 16, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. These aren't just campfire stories, legends. These are not things that have been concocted by men's ideas. No, we've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made, unto you the, made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Peter is speaking from first-hand experience, see? All right, now I'll come back to where we just were in chapter 3. And uh, so he says, uh, again, be diligent. Verse 14, that you may be found of Him in peace. Now, that's the joy of the believer, that we have peace with God. We don't have to worry about the life to come. We know that we're already His. All right, that we may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Well, now we can't gain that by our own endeavor. So again, it goes back to what the scriptures tell us, that we're washed by that shed blood of Christ, we're declared forgiven, and we have nothing against us. We're blameless. Now that word rings a bell. I've got time now, I'm sure, before we get to the end. So come back with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And this is a verse that some people don't like. Rubs them wrong. And I can't help that. We stand on what the book says. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And remember, the Corinthians were the most carnal of any of the congregations that Paul had established. They were babes in Christ. They had a lot of problems. A lot of people today would say they weren't even Christians. But that's not what the book says, see? All right, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. 
I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you, to these Corinthians, by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him, in all utterance, in other words, every word they spoke reflected their new life in Christ, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. In other words, they came out of their pagan background, their lives were transformed, and they became testimonies of God's saving grace. All right, so even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, now verse 7, so that you come behind in no gift, everything that was potentially there was for them to enjoy, but waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember when we taught this introduction in the book of James, even Paul and his followers thought that the body of Christ would be raptured before the tribulation would begin. It would be separated from Israel, of course, but they were too looking for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you, or make everything absolute. He will confirm you to the end. He's never going to let go of you. Why? So that you may be what? blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the believer, the true believer, even though we may fail from day to day, yet when the Lord comes, and if we're suddenly alive and remain and are translated, we will never stand before the Lord with sin to confess. We're going to be blameless automatically. And that isn't license for loose living, no need, no way, shape, or form. But we are, in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we're translated into His presence, we will be immediately blameless. Now, we're still going to come before the Lord for reward for what we've done in our bodies, but we are never going to have to shake in our boots before the Lord and having sin to deal with. That will be automatically cleansed and removed. All right, back to 2 Peter now then. Verse 15. Now here are verses that some of you probably think I run into the ground, but I'll tell you what. When I saw these several years ago, I thought, boy, this is what I've been looking for. Because you see, a lot of people kind of get on my case for making too much of Paul. That after all, they're going to follow the Lord Jesus. They're going to follow Peter because I had another one just yesterday I was reading. I'll follow Peter because, after all, Peter spent three years with Jesus. He understood everything that he said and did, so I'll follow Peter, not Paul. But here we have that same Peter admonishing even his Jewish followers that if they want true salvation, that is, I think he's speaking in terms of days to come, and without really knowing himself, but by inspiration of the Spirit, realizing that all these things are not going to be culminated. The Spirit knew that we're going to go on into a 2,000 year of grace. So I think with that in mind, the Spirit must have inspired Peter to write, account or understand that the long suffering, the patience of our Lord is salvation. Now we've stressed this before. From Genesis especially chapter 3, when Adam and Eve have fallen, all the way from Genesis clear through to the end of the human experience, the whole heart of God is the salvation of the human being. Like we saw in our last program, God's not willing that any should perish. Well, if He didn't want them to perish, what did He want them to have? Salvation. And salvation is that saved from eternal doom, but saved unto a life of service and love for the Creator, for the Savior, however you want to refer to Him. All right, so Peter now writing to Jewish believers, 
is reminding them now that even as our beloved brother Paul. Now this, just stop and think a minute. That took some doing. Because come back with me to Galatians. Back to Galatians. Chapter 2. Back to Galatians chapter 2, another portion that we use so often because it shows so explicitly the difference between Peter's ministry and Paul's. Peter was an apostle of Israel, along with the eleven. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, totally separated. And never can you mix the two all together. You keep them separated, and this Bible is as plain and easy to understand as anything can be. All right, so in Galatians chapter 2, and for sake of time, I'm going to just come on down that after all the arguments and the discussions and what have you, Galatians 2 verse 9. Galatians 2 verse 9. Now when James and Peter and John. Now it's amazing that it's not the way we normally speak it. It isn't Peter, James, and John. It's James and Peter and John. So James is in the place of superiority now. And these guys seem to be pillars. What does that mean? Well, they weren't what they thought they were. Now back in the early days of the Jerusalem church, back during Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, and 5, they were pillars of the Jerusalem church. Everything rested on those 12 men as they were proclaiming that Jesus the Christ was their Messiah, whom you killed, but God raised from the dead. All right, so they were the kingpins. In fact, it says so plainly that when these Jews, even Barnabas, who had land on the island of Cyprus, sold it, what did he do with the proceeds? Brought them and laid it at the feet of the apostles. They were the ones that were in control of everything. They were the ones that were preaching the gospel of the kingdom, of course. They were the ones administering this common kitty, out of which everyone got whatever they need and no one lacked. And so they were. They were the pillars of the Jerusalem church. But now, you see, when we get to about 51 A.D., which is about 30-some years after Pentecost, Paul, by the inspiration of this Holy Spirit, tells us that they seemed to be pillars. They weren't, but they thought they were. Well, why weren't they? Because the whole Jewish program is falling apart because of Israel's unbelief. And they're not coming to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, and instead they're turning more and more in unbelief. And even Paul's own experience, twice in the book of Acts, when he tried to appeal to the Jewish people and they rebelled against him, what did he say? From henceforth we go to the Gentile. He got to Rome and he called for the Jewish leadership of Rome. And they came to where he was under house arrest. And again he pleaded to them on the basis of who Jesus Christ really was and how they had rejected him. But they believed him not. And so Acts 28, 28, what does Paul say? From henceforth we go to the Gentiles. And they're going to hear it. All right, so as Israel is continuing to reject Christ's kingdom and his authority as their Messiah, it's falling apart. Falling through the cracks is the best way I always explain it. And so the twelve were no longer the pillars that they had been. There was nothing there to pillar. And that's why Paul uses that. And so they who seemed to be pillars, but they weren't. When they understood, verse 9 again, back in Galatians 2, and so when they understood the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, a gentleman's agreement. And here was the agreement, that we, Paul and Barnabas, should go to the heathen, to the Gentiles. And they, Peter and the eleven would go to the circumcision, Israel. Now that's as plain as language can make it. Paul and Barnabas were designated to be the apostles of the Gentiles. Peter and the eleven are the apostles of Israel. We'll stay with the Jew. You go to the Gentile. Gentlemen's agreement. And like I've said over and over, especially in my class in Oklahoma, 
What kind of a cad would Peter have been if he'd turned right around after a gentleman's agreement and start ministering to Gentile? A cad is what it would be. He had gone against his own word. But he didn't. There is nothing in Scripture to indicate that Peter ever went to a ministry with the, with the Gentiles. He stayed with Israel. All right, now let's come on down. So this consul ends on, on a good note, and Paul and Barnabas go back merrily on their way to their Gentile ministry, and Peter and the eleven are going to continue there with Israel in Jerusalem. Okay, now verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, sometime later, years later, I think, and he came visiting up at Antioch, as a representative, of course, of the Jewish church in Jerusalem. When Peter was come to Antioch, Paul says, I withstood him to the face. I think he had to jump on a soapbox to do it, but <laughs> whatever. Peter was eyeball to eyeball with, with Paul. And Paul was upset. Now, we're pretty, pretty confident that Paul had a temper of sorts. He could get real upset, and here was one of them. He was upset with Peter to no end, and he says, And I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. He was at fault. Verse 12, here's why. For before that certain came from James, that is, when Peter was visiting up here at Antioch with this Gentile congregation, but while he's there, some Jews come down from Jerusalem, from the Jerusalem church. And so he says, when certain came from James, or the Jerusalem church, Peter did eat with the Gentiles. He had now come to realize that Paul's converts were just as much in God's fold as any Jew could be. And so he ate with the Gentiles. But when these Jews came from Jerusalem, Peter, bless his heart, and you know what you have to think of? The little maid at the fire. Peter must have been a big guy, but he must have had a weak will. Because, you see, as soon as these people came from Jerusalem, Peter chickened out. He should have just dug his heels in and said, Listen, there's no reason why I shouldn't eat with these believing Gentiles. But he chickened out, and because of those men from Jerusalem, he withdrew, Paul says, verse 12. And he withdrew and separated himself. In other words, wouldn't eat with those Gentile believers, fearing them who were of the circumcision. Real human, wasn't he? He was afraid of what these Jews would take back to Jerusalem. And what would they take back? Do you know what Peter is doing? He's back eating with Gentiles again. He's back on those ham sandwiches. See? <laughs> Just like up at Cornelius, back in Acts chapter 10, the same thing happened when the Jews at Jerusalem got wind of the fact that Peter had gone into a Gentile home. They were upset, and the Scripture word is they contended with him, and they said, you went to Gentile, and on top of that, you ate with him. Peter, how could you? Well, same thing here. Same thing all over again. And Peter chickens out. And instead it's taking his stand and ref refuting these Gentile, or these Jewish emissaries from Jerusalem. He should have just stood up and said, Look, we're all believers. We're all serving the same Christ. But he didn't, see? And so he feared those who were of the circumcision from the, Jew the Jerusalem church. Now verse 13. And the other Jews who were converts and members of Paul's and Barnabas' Antioch congregation, even the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. In other words, they pulled out with Peter. And oh, this is the one that's hard to believe. Insomuch that even Barnabas, who was back in that first council meeting when they shook hands to keep separate Gentiles and the Jews, insomuch that even Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation or their false ideas. Verse 14, But, Paul writes, When I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth 
of the gospel. Well, what's he referring to? That part and parcel of Paul's gospel of grace is that there is no difference. A Jew is just as much in need of salvation as a Gentile. And when he becomes a believer, he's just as much a member of the body of Christ as a Gentile. And so that's what Paul is saying. They didn't walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. And so he said, I said to Peter before them all, an open public rebuke, and it must have been humiliating. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as Jews? Now, that's almost a double talk there, but what you've got is, now Peter, you're a Jew, and you've been eating with these Gentiles, and you've been recognizing that there really is no difference. Now, if that's the case, why do you now all of a sudden compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews? And that came up, of course, in that council back here ahead of all this, where they agreed that Paul and Barnabas would go to the Gentiles. So anyway, here Peter has been publicly rebuked by the little apostle Paul. And I think Paul was a little short fellow. And now look what he says. And here's why I have to admire Peter. My, how he can come right back in Christian love and, and oversight of what Paul had done years back. And now by inspiration, remember, the Holy Spirit prompts him to write that even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. Now he's talking to Jews. And there's only one portion of Scripture that Paul wrote to Jews. And what would that be? The book of Hebrews. And so from this, I'm quite adamant that Paul wrote Hebrews. And it was directed to Jews who were having a hard time coming out of Judaism and stepping into this gospel of grace. All right, but don't stop there. Now verse 16. Not just in Hebrews, but in all his epistles, Romans through Philemon, speaking in them of these things. What things? Salvation. That's why I'm always saying, as we started Hebrews a couple years ago, what was the first thing I said? You won't find the plan of salvation in Hebrews. There's not a Roman road in Hebrews. It's not in there. You won't find the plan of salvation laid out in Acts. You won't find it laid out in these little Jewish epistles. It's not in there. And if you want the plan of salvation for us in the age of grace, you've got to find it between Romans 1.1 1, 1 and the last verse of Philemon. And it's in there over and over and over. And Peter is reminding us that if you want salvation in this age of grace, you go to Paul's epistles. That's Peter speaking. Now, if I could just get some of these people to jump all over me for making too much of Paul to read this and realize that Peter didn't make Peter made just as much of Paul as I do. Peter says, if you want true salvation, you go to Paul's epistles. And I say the same thing. If you want to know the real Christian walk in this age of grace, you go to Paul's epistles. If you want to know the end of the church on this earth, you go to Paul's epistles. It's the only place you'll find it. All right? And so he says, is in all his epistles, speaking him then of these things. Now here goes the heart of Peter again. In which, in Paul's epistles, are some things hard to be understood. Now, how in the world could a man with Peter's experience, with Peter's walk with the Lord, with Peter's clout in the church of Jerusalem, tell the whole world that he had problems understanding some of Paul's writing. Quite an admission, wasn't it? I don't know what it was. I've got an idea. I think he was so steeped in that legalism of Judaism that he just simply had a hard time dropping some of that stuff and stepping into Paul's gospel of grace. Because it's not it. That's the problem with most people today. 
They just cannot drop some of that works religion and take these things by faith plus nothing. It rubs against the grain. And Peter admits it by the inspiration of the Spirit, see? All right, but now reading on. Which they that are unlearned, the scoffers again, the false teachers, if they use Paul's stuff at all, they're going to twist it. And these that are unlearned and unstable twist all out of shape, even as they do the other scriptures. Now, the amazing thing by that one statement, just that statement right there, the other scriptures, what is Peter putting on Paul's epistles? The stamp of inspiration. It's just as much scripture as what Moses wrote. What Paul writes is just as much the word of God of what the prophets wrote. It's just as much the word of God of what Peter wrote or what Jesus said or anybody else. It's all Scripture according to Scripture. See that? All right, and so they've twisted these things even as they do also the other Scriptures. Not just Paul, but they twist all of them to their own destruction. All right, now I hope I've made my point that Peter admonishes the people today to go to Paul's epistles. Whereas most of Christendom says, go to Matthew. Evidently, that's what they tell them, because that's where all the preaching is. But Peter doesn't do that. Peter says, you go to Paul's epistles. For in them is where we know we can find eternal life. See? All right, now then, one more verse. We're going to make it, honey. Verse 17, you therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before... Beware lest you also being led away with the error of the wicked. Now he comes right back to those false teachers that we talked about earlier. Don't fall into the error of the wicked and thereby fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding.